So the urinary system is otherwise known as the renal system. So if someone is, has dysfunctional kidneys, they'll have what we call renal dialysis. And uh, that's just another name for the kidneys. So looking at the urinary system, we have a pair of kidneys. They're on the back wall of the peritoneal cavity. So they're behind the peritoneum. We call them retroperitoneal, which means they're behind the peritoneal cavity. And the left kidney is a little higher than the right. They're not very well protected, so people can be, you know, severely injured, you know, have damage to their kidneys if they're in a car accident or in boxing, football, you know, those high-impact sports. Um, they're about the size of a large bar of soap, so they're not really very big. If we ha had a chance to look at the cadaver, you'd see, you know, they're just about that big, you know, about the size, you know, of your palm, a little bigger maybe, depending on the size of your hands. But um, they don't, they have a, a lot of fat around them, and that holds the, them up and holds them in place. So if a person loses a lot of weight, they're, they can get rid of that fat around the kidney, and the kidneys can actually kind of droop and cause the ureter to kink. So people that are very, very thin are at risk for that problem. So we need a little bit of fat around them just to keep them in place. So looking at their functions, the functions of the kidney is to filter blood. That's number one. So the blood is well oxygenated when it's in the abdominal aorta, right? And it's going to feed all the tissues with oxygen. But there's toxins that have built up. Like when we're breaking down you know, proteins, for example, we secrete urea and phosphoric acid is formed, and some of these byproducts of metabolism are in our blood. Well, as it enters into the renal artery and enters into the kidney, those toxins are filtered out. So it's really, really important that our kidneys be functioning or these toxins, especially nitrogen-containing toxins, build up and can cause death. So we, even if we're not drinking a lot of water, we're still going to produce a small amount of urine because we have to get rid of those toxins. So we know that we can only go how many days without water before death occurs because you're going to produce some urine, you're going to lose that fluid, blood pressure is going to drop, blood volume is going to go down, and you're going to die. So how long? Three days, yeah, yeah. Three days without water and we're done for. So we need that fluid constantly coming in. So by filtering out the blood, it can regulate the volume in our blood. So if you drink a lot of water, what do you notice? the same day, a couple hours, you urinate a lot more. So it's getting rid of that excess fluid because if we absorb that water into our digest, through our digestive tract, into our capillaries and into our bloodstream, what would happen to blood pressure if I keep bringing in water and I'm not peeing it away? Blood pressure would go up, right? If I keep drinking water, it goes into my bloodstream, plasma volume goes up, blood pressure goes up, and you can die from that. So if our kidneys are functioning properly, then we pee that excess away. And if you're not drinking enough, do you pee a lot? No. We pee a very small amount because then we want to hold our blood volume and make sure we keep blood pressure up. So it's constantly regulating that. And concentration of blood solutes. So we've got all these electrolytes that we absorbed from our food into our digestive tract, into our blood, and those are regulated by the kidney. And what do you think the number one electrolyte is in the urine that we have plenty of here in the United States? Sodium, yeah, sodium chloride very, uh, you know, well provided in our food, so we find those in the urine. So we're constantly uh, regulating those electrolytes. And pH of extracellular fluid. So as this fluid comes through, and depending on what's in our plasma, if we have acidic conditions in the plasma, let's say we have a lot of lactic acid because of, you know, prolonged seizure activity, exhaustion from running an Ironman, so you have all this lactic acid buildup. What is the, what's the number one ion that determines acidity in the body? Hydrogen ion, yeah. So if we have excess hydrogen ion, the kidneys can take care of that by secreting it into the nephron and putting it in the urine. So an acidic urine, no big deal, right? Because it's leaving the body. It's in the bladder. It's not part of the plasma anymore. So an acidic urine can keep our pH, our blood pH, in the normal range. And what's the normal range for blood pH? 7.35 to 7.45. So that's slightly, what is that, acidic or basic? It's basic because it's greater than 7. But if we dip less than 7.35, we call that a physiologic acidosis because we're more acidic than what's normal. So whenever we dip lower than 7.35, the kidneys are going to secrete hydrogen ion. 
and it's going to reabsorb the other ion that soaks up hydrogen ion, and that's bicarbonate ion. Bicarbonate ion, remember that's HCO3 minus. That binds H plus because negative binds positive. So that will soak up excess hydrogen ion. So the kidneys can regulate hydrogen ion, bicarbonate ion in the plasma, and that's really important for controlling that blood pH. And then blood cell synthesis, um, when we are in a low oxygen environment, let's say someone's got a bad case of asthma, pneumonia, COPD, emphysema, they're hiking up at you know Pikes Peak in Colorado, low oxygen environment, the kidneys respond by secreting a hormone called erythropoietin, but we don't, kind of a long name there you can see at the bottom of your page there, but we abbreviated EPO, and what's nice about that is EPO will e increase from the kidney cells when oxygen levels are low, and that hormone acts on the bone marrow and stimulates red blood cell production. So the more EPO, the more red blood cells you have, and the more oxygen, hopefully, carrying ability you have in your blood. And we talked about that before with Lance Armstrong, right, how he did the blood doping, where he had his blood, some of his blood removed, which stimulates the kidneys to increase EPO production, increase red blood cell production from the bone marrow, and then he could go the distance in the Tour de France because he had more blood cells carrying more oxygen. So people, though, that have <coughs> um, chronic lung disease have higher EPO production. And the more red blood cells you have, the higher your hematocrit. A hematocrit is a, is a measurement, a lab value for the number of red blood cells per unit volume of blood. So you have thicker blood. Would you agree if you have more red blood cells in your blood that you have thicker blood? So what does that increase the risk for if you have thick blood? Clotting, yeah. So it's not an ideal situation to have a high hematocrit chronically, but people with lung disease, they do. And then vitamin D, the, the kidney, so when we are out in the sunlight, the skin makes a precursor to vitamin D. Then that travels into the, through the blood to the liver. The liver adds a little piece, changes that vitamin D molecule a little bit more. Then it passes to the kidney, and the kidney puts it in its final form to where we use it for what? Vitamin D has a whole host of functions, but what's a major one? No. <laughs> a little bit. I, actually, I shouldn't say that. It has something to do with calcium. What does it do with calcium? Yeah, it allows us to absorb. It escorts calcium out of the digestive tract into the blood, and it keeps our bones strong. So we know that women should take a calcium supplement if they're, you know, worried about their calcium intake, along with a vitamin D, that most of the time that both are in the same pill because it helps us absorb calcium. And we know that vitamin D is good for fighting depression. It's good for immune function. There's a whole host of functions. Every cell in the body has receptors for vitamin D. I read that somewhere. So don't quote me on that, but it's important. So I take it every day just because they're cheap, tiny, little, easy, very easy to swallow pills. We used to say like four to 600 was the max per day. Now some people are taking five to 10,000. We don't really even know. All we do know is 80% of, Ameri of Americans are deficient in vitamin D. 80%, yeah, because it's hard to measure vitamin D levels accurately, but we do, we do all do that. and. When a family member of mine went in for mental health, depression, they said, let's get a vitamin D level. So they do know that vitamin D and depression are linked. And, and how often do we just throw pills at the symptoms and not correct the problem here in the United States? It's kind of a little issue with our healthcare system. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, you're in a bad relationship, you know, you're yeah, you're out of control with your lifestyle, you've got some addictions going on, here let's just take this antidepressant and call it good, right? No, antidepressants are for temporary, right? If you're going, if, if you're normally are, were stable, mentally stable as far as your neurotransmitter levels, and then you go through a bad time, well yes, you need that to kind of keep your mood up, right? People going through a divorce, you know, traumatic experience. But then the goal is to try to get off those medicines and restabilize, if possible. Now, some people, the brain is like the pancreas, which is like anything else, right? If it doesn't function right, if it's not able to produce what it needs to produce, then long-term meds are definitely appropriate. But they talk about mild 
to moderate anxiety depression can be treated with you know good nutrition and exercise but too often you know people just continue making bad decisions and end up you know with these medicines needing more and more of it so okay so then moving on we talked about all the different functions of the urinary system then let's look at the nephron it's the structural and functional unit of the kidney so structural and functional means that the kidneys made up of these and when we talk about what the kidneys do it's the nephrons that are doing the work they're the workers so if I said what is the structural and functional unit of Western Technical College depends on whose perspective you're looking at right yeah right students are the instructor so if you come to TC say I'm going to come to TC because I want you to learn Who's doing the teaching? The instructor. So, and I don't say that because I think I'm all special or anything, but you know, think of it that way. If you go to the grocery store and you want to buy groceries, what's the structural functional unit of the grocery store? The people that are checking out the groceries, stocking the shelves, right? <laughs> but function, think of function. It's not just what they're made up of, but the function. if there's no teachers buy anything right yeah <laughs> right so the structural functional unit means it's what the kidney does the kidney filters urine what fi filters the urine the nephron the nephron filters the urine so the nephron is made up of a couple of different parts we talked about this in lab already so I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit here so we have Bowman's capsule is the beginning of the nephron. Then we have the proximal convoluted tubule. Then it dips down into this thin U-shaped loop of Henle. Then it comes back up into the cortex, and it's the distal convoluted tubule. And that's the end of the nephron. So this long collecting duct has different attachment points for different nephrons to hook up to it. So that's not part of the nephron. So it's just PCT for proximal convoluted tubule, Bowman's capsule, loop of Henle, and DCT, distal convoluted tubule. And each part is specialized to do a special thing for that filtering and filtering process. We'll talk about it. So the kidneys filter, according to this sheet here um, on the previous page, kidneys filter 200 milliliters of fluid from the blood every day. And every 20 minutes, sorry? Did I say milliliters? Sorry, I was going to say that didn't sound right. Um, every 20 minutes, your um, kidneys filter your entire blood volume. Every 20 minutes. So what would happen if our kidneys, so that's what gets squeezed out into the nephron. Do you think we have to pull some of that nephron fluid back and put it in the blood? Yeah, if it's every 20 minutes, that would be you know, 200 liters. You know, leaving your system in a day, you'd be dead, right? We essentially pee away our plasma volume in about 22 minutes. So that's how active your kidneys are. Question? Exactly. Yep, good question. They're part of the cardiovascular system. And that is what receives the stuff that we need to put back in the blood. So we don't pee away our plasma volume in 22 minutes, right? Okay. Less than 30. Does it say less than 30? Oh, right, about 30. Yeah. About. That's my disclaimer. <laughs> it's, yeah, 22 minutes is what your textbook says. But if we say, and it depends on how fast your kidneys are doing what they're doing, right? Depends on your kidney function. So. Yes, so anything in that range is acceptable. <clears throat> so looking at filtration then, this is the start of the process. So we have blood coming in from the renal artery to the kidney, enters through the afferent arterial, and gets squeezed out into Bowman's capsule. So here's your arterial. Here's the, the branches of the renal artery. It branches and branches. It has different names. You'll learn that if you have to take advanced AP. And then it gets squeezed out into Bowman's capsule. Fluid, very, very tiny particles. So it says plasma and small molecules are what are squeezed out into Bowman's capsule. So what's left in the glomerulus? What stays in the blood? 
Think of it like when you're making macaroni and cheese. You don't want to dump your noodles down the sink, right? So you use a, maybe a colander. Some people just use the lid of the pot. That doesn't work for me. I always get burned. So I always use a colander. Dump them in the, you know, strainer, sieve. Everybody has a different name for it. Oh, they call hockey players that, uh, not the goalie, you know, because they let the pucks through, you know. Yeah, leak like a sieve, S-I-E-V-E, sieve, yeah. Anyway, potato, potato, right? <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> anyway, so you, you throw it in the thing, the plastic with the holes, and the <laughs> noodles. <laughs> First grade <laughs> level. Um, holds back the noodles, right? Because you don't want those to go down the sink. But the red blood cells are like the noodles, right? You don't want to lose the red blood cells. Those need to stay in the blood so they can you know, carry oxygen and do their job. So that's what the, the red circles are. Red blood cells, are white blood cells big also? They're bigger than red blood cells, right? So those are gonna stay in there. So should we see cloudy urine? No, should we see red urine? No, that means you know there's red blood cells in there, so no. And then larger proteins, like albumin is a large plasma protein that keeps water in our blood vessels to keep our blood pressure up. That should not be in our urine either. So those are too big to pass out of that glomerular capillary network. And then whatever remains leaves the glomerulus via the efferent arterial, and that becomes the paratubular capillaries eventually. That'll twine around the, the nephron to become the paratubular capillary. So the blue here is what is tiny and gets filtered out. So this is glucose, amino acids, electrolytes, water, tiny proteins. That gets filtered out. Do we want to lose glucose, water, tiny proteins, amino acids into our urine and pee away into the toilet? No, because that's nutrition, right? We just absorb this stuff from our from our digestive tract into the blood, we don't want to just filter it away in the kidneys and pee it all away. We need to pull it back. So filtration is the first step. It's non-selective. That's the key. Make sure you underline or highlight that. Non-selective gets dumped out into Bowman's capsule. And what causes it to leave the glomerulus and enter Bowman's capsule is filtration pressure. So we gotta have some squeeze to get it out of that glomerulus. So what is what controls the pressure coming into the glomerulus, do you think? What? Blood pressure. The contraction and relaxation of the heart exerts a pressure in that renal artery, which comes into the afferent arterial, which determines how much of a squeeze out of the glomerulus these particles are going to get. So the higher the blood pressure, the more the squeeze. But the afferent arterial can constrict, if necessary, to protect that delicate glomerulus because there's a million nephrons in each kidney. So you think these are teeny tiny? Yes, and capillaries are made up of simple squamous epithelium. If we get too big of a pressure, blow out your glomerulus, and now you're going to see red blood cells, white blood cells, because you've got a damaged glomerulus that's too leaky from too much pressure. Are you raising your hand or itching your eyebrow? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's just irritation of the urinary tract. Yeah, yeah. They can look. Exactly, exactly. It can work its way up, though. If a person doesn't treat a urinary tract infection, it can work its way up through the tract, up to the kidneys, and cause a kidney infection. And then what we would look for are large proteins in the urine, not just blood, not just pus, not just white blood cells, because that can be part of the infection. But when you start to see albumin in there, then we know it's a glomerulus problem because albumin is that large plasma protein that's supposed to stay up in the blood and not leave the glomerulus. So then we know there's glomerular damage. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And they can usually see kidney stones too, larger right. ones, you know. Mm. Yeah, maybe they look for, I'm not sh familiar with kidney stones, maybe they'll, maybe, like if you have a stone that's actually blocking, you know, the, 
whatever, wherever it's blocked, um, can be really you know painful for sure. But are there smaller particles that are leaking out into the urine that led to that stone that they test for? That might be. It is. Calcium phosphate is the number one component of most kidney stones. Yeah, yeah. Would you see higher calcium levels in the in the urine? Possibly. Yeah. I'm not real familiar with kidney stones. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They're terrible. I heard that for guys because they have the longer urethra that it's like the male version of childbirth. They say, except you don't get the cute baby at the end. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. So this pressure then, we have pressures of fluid in Bowman's capsule that pushes against the glomerulus, keeping things in the glomerulus. And we have blood pressure inside the glomerulus, glomerulus wanting to squeeze that fluid out. And then you have solutes in the glomerulus, like plasma proteins, that suck water in. So there's a balance of these pressures at the glomerulus. And when we subtract them out from the pressures coming in, which is blood pressure, we come up with about 10 millimeters of mercury. <clears throat> acting outward on Bowman's capsule. No, not at this level. You will need to know that in advanced a &P. <clears throat> So reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule, then this is where we need to take this stuff that's been filtered out, our, glomerul our uh, glucose, amino acids, electrolytes, and water, all of the glucose, all of the amino acids, because we need that for metabolism and nutrition, gets reabsorbed back to the blood right here in the first part of the nephron. So these substances are leaving the blood and going back to the, are leaving the nephron and going back to the blood. And what do we call these capillaries wrapped up around the nephrons? Peri means around, tubular capillaries, yeah, peritubular capillaries. So they wrap around the nephron and they receive those substances right back to the blood. Because we do not pee away not even a little bit of glucose if our pancreas is functioning properly and we don't have a, you know, extremely high blood glucose levels. Because there's, there's protein transporters that move these things that are in the, in the wall of the proximal convoluted tubule that are pulling these things out. But what happens if you have, you know, all those protein transporters are full because you've got really high glucose levels coming into the nephron? Can they keep up? No. Then the excess is going to end up in the urine, and that's a sign of diabetes. We should not see, glu see glucose in the urine. Or if, unless someone is um, like under extreme amount of stress and they have high blood sugar levels because of that. So here's the proximal convoluted tubule. It's the number one site for reabsorption. Again, reabsorption. We first absorb these things in the digestive tract. So they, whenever we talk about absorption, you have a question? Yes. They're wrapped around the proximal and convoluted tubules. They're outside. They're, they're an extension of the efferent arterial. So if you look in your textbook, um, it kind of puts all those structures together. Um, page 968 in your textbook. Yeah, I don't think those had the vessels right there. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I don't know what that term specifically, if that's Bowman's space, that would be, well, that's okay. I mean, right, right, right. I really like that animation because it shows the movement of particles. You need to know the, the diagram from your textbook, page 968. No, no. And that's more of a, um, a lab thing, so just use the terms from your lab packet. And Bowman's capsule is what we call it, the inside, right? So on 968, it shows the peritubular capillaries that are receiving that glucose, amino acids, water, and most of the sodium. So 65% of the water and the sodium are entering back into the blood. We absorbed them the first time in the digestive tract. So anytime we use the word absorption, 
we're talking about moving it to the blood, okay? So absorption always means going to the blood. So when we absorb it from our digestive tract, we're absorbing nutrients to the blood. When we reabsorb it in the kidney, we're absorbing it from the kidney back to the blood. So really, really important that you know what absorption means. When we talk about absorption or reabsorption, we're talking about moving anything, substances, back to the blood. Okay, so in the loop of Henle, special reabsorption occurs in the loop of Henle. So there's an, there's an ascending limb and there's a descending limb. So you have your proximal convoluted tubule here, then you have the loose loop of Henle, and then you have the distal convoluted tubule. So this is called the descending limb on the left side, and the right side is the ascending limb because that urine is coming back up. So there's an arrow here on the diagram, talks about filtrate flow. So it's leaving the proximal convoluted tubule and it's coming down, descending limb. What we find is that the descending limb is permeable to water. So water leaves the descending loop of Henle, and then as it comes back up again toward the distal convoluted tubule in the thick portion at the top, salt leaves the nephron and enters into the blood. So the loop of Henle, the descending limb, is only permeable to water, and in the ascending limb, it's only permeable to salt. You know, I was just looking at that, and I can, it's, it's moving toward the interstitial fluid. Whoops. Okay, so just to reiterate, the descending limb is only permeable to water, so water leaves. As water leaves, it causes a dilute interstitial fluid here, which is going to cause solute, a concentration difference for solute in the capillary compared to outside the capillary in the interstitial fluid. But this arrow makes it look like it's entering, <laughs> it makes it look like it's entering the loop of Henle, but it's not. It's stuck in the interstitial fluid. So you want to cross off the tip of these arrows because it makes it look like um, solute is diffusing into the descending loop, and it's not. It diffuses out of the capillary because we've created a dilute interstitial fluid, but it's not going to diffuse into the descending limb. Only water can leave the descending limb. Then on the other side, the reverse is true. So solute can diffuse out into the paratube or into the um, capillary, and water stays in. <coughs> And the function of this loop of Henle is to create a concentration gradient to create a concentrated urine. And it's called a countercurrent multiplier system, which is uh, shown in your textbook on 984. But that is an advanced concept of the urinary system that we save for advanced A&P. So all you need to know is what's going on in this nephron. Proximal convoluted tubule, 100% of the, of the Amino acids and glucose are leaving 65% of the sodium, leaving, going back to the blood. Loop of Henle descending, what's leaving? Water, Water only. Ascending, salt. salt only. And then we get back higher up, we get to the distal convoluted tubule. Then we have secretion occurring. So secretion is where now we're going to take things from the blood and dump it into the collecting duct or the distal convoluted tubule. So those, that's kind of like the end of the nephron where the reabsorption is primarily complete. Now we're going to get rid of any excesses that are still in the blood, and we're going to actively secrete those into the nephron. So secretion is going from the blood to the nephron as urine. So hydrogen, our hydrogen ion, if we're acidic, potassium ion, urea, metabolites from different drugs like penicillins and things like that will enter. And these, these last two parts of the nephron, so I'm going to go back up 
and just show you the overall nephron again. This distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, these are under hormonal control. So if the endocrine system secretes hormones, we can further impact reabsorption that is occurring here in this last part. So there is some reabsorption, but it's not um, controlled just within the nephron itself, it's controlled by hormones. So if I have increased ADH production, that's going to cause the collecting duct to get little holes in it called aquaporin so we can reabsorb water. So antidiuretic hormone means anti-PE hormone. So if we have vomiting and diarrhea and we're really dehydrated, our posterior pituitary is going to release ADH. That's going to act on the collecting duct, inserting aquaporins, so and we're going to reabsorb water back to the blood and produce very little urine. So ADH is the anti-PE hormone, less urine production when ADH secretion goes up. Now what happens if a person's out at the bar and they're drinking lots of beer and then all of a sudden they say, oh, I gotta go to the bathroom and someone says, oh, once you break the seal, right? What does that mean? Alcohol in higher amounts blocks ADH production. So if you're blocking the anti-pee hormone, what are you gonna do? <laughs> pee. And a person may notice when that happens and they pee, it's very clear, watery, high volume. So it's plasma. They're essentially peeing away their plasma that was meant to be reabsorbed to go back to the blood. They're peeing it away. So how do people wake up the next morning? Dry mouth, headache, because they peed away their plasma. They're very much dehydrated in the morning. So some of the best things a person can do throughout the evening, if they're gonna have drinks throughout the evening, drink some water in between there big glass of water before they go to bed and stave off some of those dehydration symptoms. Aldosterone is produced by the adrenal cortex, which sits on top of the kidney, and that increases sodium reabsorption. Renin is produced by the kidneys, and it causes vasoconstriction, which helps to raise blood pressure, and it also causes more aldosterone secretion. So ADH, aldosterone, and renin, all three of those act on the kidney in some way to increase blood pressure. So these three hormones are really important to fix a low blood pressure. Because which is more dangerous, low blood pressure or high blood pressure on a minute to minute basis? Low. My blood pressure, blood pressure is low. I don't get oxygen to my brain and vital organs and I die very quickly. If my blood pressure is a little high, we can still survive that for a while depending how high it is, right? Atrial natriuretic hormone, that's in the atria. That inhibits ADH, ADH production. And that's going to, if you inhibit it, you're gonna pee away fluid. What's that gonna do to blood pressure if you increase peeing? Drop it. So that's the only one that reduces the high blood pressure is the atrial natriuretic hormone. So we have more hormones in place acting on the kidney that correct a falling blood pressure than we do a high blood pressure. So when we give someone caffeine, Lasix is what we give in the hospital via IV if they've got really high blood pressure and too much fluid, we're gonna give them that medicine and that inhibits sodium reabsorption in the loop of Henle. So if we inhibit sodium reabsorption and we know that water follows salt, that's gonna keep water in the loop of Henle as well and they're gonna increase their peeing by a large amount. So what do I have to be careful of if I have someone on a Lasix drip? Uh, what? Well, if they're on a Lasix drip, what are they going to be doing a lot of? Peeing. So if it's a little old lady who needs a cane and a help of two to get to the bathroom, is it a good idea to put her on a Lasix drip and put her in the end of the hall? No, because we know she's going to be on the light constantly. So uh, how about an old man? Give him a urinal and be prepared to be emptying it a lot, right? Sometimes you put people, you give them a catheter during the 24 hours because they're peeing so much. And if they are, watch that bag because it's going to, if it, their kidneys are working well, it's going to fill quickly. All right, we'll pick up next time with a micturition reflex. And we'll review some of these processes one more time.